Chapter 7 of Canyons of the Colorado. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Brian Ness. Canyons of the Colorado by John Wesley Powell. Chapter 7 The Canyon of Lodor. June 8. We enter the canyon, and until noon find a succession of rapids over which our boats have to be taken. Here I must explain our method of proceeding at such places. The Emma Dean goes in advance, the other boats follow, in obedience to signals. When we approach a rapid, or what on other rivers would often be called a fall, I stand on deck to examine it while the oarsmen backwater, and we drift on as slowly as possible. If I can see a clear chute between the rocks, away we go. But if the channel is beset entirely across, we signal the other boats, pull to land, and I walk along the shore for closer examination. If this reveals no clear channel, hard work begins. We drop the boats to the very head of the dangerous place and let them over by lines or make a portage, frequently carrying both boats and cargoes over the rocks. The waves caused by such falls in a river differ much from the waves of the sea. The water of an ocean wave merely rises and falls. The form only passes on, and form chases form unceasingly. A body floating on such waves merely rises and sinks, it does not progress unless impelled by wind or some other power. But here the water of the wave passes on while the form remains. The waters plunge down ten or twenty feet to the foot of a fall, spring up again in a great wave, then down and up in a series of billows that gradually disappear in the more quiet waters below. But these waves are always there, and one can stand above and count them. A boat riding such billows leaps and plunges along with great velocity. Now the difficulty in riding over these falls, when no rocks are in the way, is with the first wave at the foot. This will sometimes gather for a moment, heap up higher and higher, and then break back. If the boat strikes at the instant after it breaks, she cuts through, and the mad breaker dashes its spray over the boat, and washes overboard all who do not cling tightly. If the boat, in going over the falls, chances to get caught in some side current, and is turned from its course so as to strike the wave broadside on, and the wave breaks at the same instant, the boat is capsized. Then we must cling to her, for the watertight compartments act as buoys, and she cannot sink. And so we go, dragged through the waves, until still waters are reached, when we right the boat and climb aboard. We have several such experiences today. At night we camp on the right bank, on a little shelving rock between the river and the foot of the cliff, and with night comes gloom into these great depths. After supper we sit by our campfire, made of driftwood caught by the rocks, and tell stories of wild life, for the men have seen such in the mountains or on the plains, and on the battlefields of the south. It is late before we spread our blankets on the beach. Lying down, we look up through the canyon and see that only a little of the blue heaven appears overhead, a crescent of blue sky with two or three constellations peering down upon us. I do not sleep for some time, as the excitement of the day has not worn off. Soon I see a bright star that appears to rest on the very verge of the cliff overhead to the east. Slowly it seems to float from its resting place on the rock over the canyon. At first it appears like a jewel set on the brink of the cliff, but as it moves out from the rock, I almost wonder that it does not fall. In fact, it does seem to descend in a gentle curve, as though the bright sky in which the stars are set were spread across the canyon, resting on either wall and swayed down by its own weight. The stars appear to be in the canyon. I soon discover that it is the bright star Vega. So it occurs to me to designate this part of the wall as the Cliff of the Harp. June 9. One of the party suggests that we call this the Canyon of Lodor, and the name is adopted. Very slowly we make our way, often climbing on the rocks at the edge of the water for a few hundred yards to examine the channel before running it. During the afternoon we come to a place where it is necessary to make a portage. The little boat is landed and the others are signaled to come up. When these rapids or broken falls occur, usually the channel is suddenly narrowed by rocks which have been tumbled from the cliffs or have been washed in by lateral streams. Immediately above the narrow, rocky channel, on one or both sides, there is often a bay of quiet water in which a landing can be made with ease. 
Sometimes the water descends into a smooth, unruffled surface from the broad, quiet spread above into the narrow, angry channel below by a semicircular sag. Great care must be taken not to pass over the brink into this deceptive pit, but above it we can row with safety. I walk along the bank to examine the ground, leaving one of my men with a flag to guide the other boats to the landing place. I soon see one of the boats make shore all right, and feel no more concern, but a minute after I hear a shout, and, looking around, see one of the boats shooting down the center of the sag. It is the no-name, with Captain Howland, his brother, and Goodman. I feel that its going over is inevitable, and run to save the third boat. A minute more, and she turns the point and heads for the shore. Then I turn downstream again, and scramble along to look for the boat that has gone over. The first fall is not great, only ten or twelve feet, and we often run such, but below the river tumbles down again for forty or fifty feet, in a channel filled with dangerous rocks that break the waves into whirlpools and beat them into foam. I pass around a great crag just in time to see the boat strike a rock, and rebounding from the shock, careen and fill its open compartment with water. Two of the men lose their oars, she swings around and is carried down at a rapid rate, broadside on, for a few yards, when striking amidships on another rock with great force she is broken quite in two, and the men are thrown into the river. But the larger part of the boat floats buoyantly, and they soon seize it, and down the river they drift past the rocks for a few hundred yards to a second rapid, filled with huge boulders, where the boat strikes again and is dashed to pieces, and the men in fragments are soon carried beyond my sight. Running along, I turn a bend and see a man's head above the water, washed about in a whirlpool below a great rock. It is Frank Goodman, clinging to the rock with a grip upon which life depends. Coming opposite, I see Howland trying to go to his aid from an island on which he has been washed. Soon he comes near enough to reach Frank with a pole, which he extends toward him. The latter lets go the rock, grasps the pole, and is pulled ashore. Seneca Howland is washed farther down the island and is caught by some rocks, and, though somewhat bruised, manages to get ashore in safety. This seems a long time as I tell it, but it is quickly done. And now the three men are on an island, with a swift, dangerous river on either side and a fall below. The Emma Dean is soon brought down, and Sumner, starting above as far as possible, pushes out. Right skillfully he plies the oars, and a few strokes set him on the island at the proper point. Then they all pull the boat upstream as far as they are able until they stand in water up to their necks. One sits on a rock and holds the boat until the others are ready to pull, then gives the boat a push, clings to it with his hands, and climbs in as they pull for mainland, which they reach in safety. We are as glad to shake hands with them as though they had been on a voyage around the world and wrecked on a distant coast. Down the river, half a mile, we find that the after-cabin of the wrecked boat with a part of the bottom, ragged and splintered, has floated against a rock and stranded. There are valuable articles in the cabin, but on examination we determine that life should not be risked to save them. Of course, the cargo of rations, instruments, and clothing is gone. We return to the boats and make camp for the night. No sleep comes to me in all those dark hours. The rations, instruments, and clothing have been divided among the boats, anticipating such an accident as this, and we started with duplicates of everything that we deemed necessary to success. But in the distribution there was one exception to this precaution. The barometers were all placed in one boat, and they are lost. There is a possibility that they are in the cabin lodged against the rock, for that is where they were kept, but then how to reach them? The river is rising. Will they be there tomorrow? Can I go out to Salt Lake City and obtain barometers from New York? June 10. I have determined to get the barometers from the wreck if they are there. After breakfast, while the men make the portage, I go down again for another examination. There the cabin lies, only carried 50 or 60 feet farther on. Carefully looking over the ground, I am satisfied it can be reached with safety and return to tell the men my conclusion. Sumner and Dunn volunteer to take the little boat and make the attempt. They start, reach it, and out come the barometers. The boys set up a shout, and I join them, pleased that they should be as glad as myself to save the instruments. When the boat lands on our side, I find that the only things saved from the wreck were the barometers, a package of thermometers, and a three-gallon keg of whiskey. The last is what the men were shouting about. They had taken it aboard unknown to me, and now I am glad they did take it, for it will do them good, as they are drenched every day by the melting snow which runs down from the summits of the Rocky Mountains. 
We come back to our work at the portage and find that it is necessary to carry our rations over the rocks for nearly a mile and to let our boats down with lines except at a few points where they also must be carried. Between the river and the eastern wall of the canyon there is an immense talus of broken rocks. These have tumbled down from the cliffs above and constitute a vast pile of huge angular fragments. On these we build a path for a quarter of a mile to a small sand beach covered with driftwood, through which we clear a way for several hundred yards, then continue the trail over another pile of rocks nearly half a mile farther down to a little bay. The greater part of the day is spent in this work. Then we carry our cargoes down to the beach and camp for the night. While the men are building the campfire, we discover an iron bake oven, several tin plates, a part of a boat, and many other fragments which denote that this is the place where Ashley's party was wrecked. June 11. This day is spent in carrying our rations down to the bay. No small task, climbing over the rocks with sacks of flour and bacon. We carry them by stages of about 500 yards each, and when night comes and the last sack is on the beach, we are tired, bruised, and glad to sleep. June 12. Today we take the boats down to the bay, while at this work we discover three sacks of flour from the wrecked boat that have lodged in the rocks. We carry them above high water mark and leave them, as our cargoes are already too heavy for the three remaining boats. We also find two or three oars, which we place with them. As Ashley and his party were wrecked here, and as we have lost one of our boats at the same place, we adopt the name Disaster Falls for the scene of so much peril and loss. Though some of his companions were drowned, Ashley and one other survived the wreck, climbed the canyon wall, and found their way across the Wasatch Mountains to Salt Lake City, living chiefly on berries, as they wandered through an unknown and difficult country. When they arrived at Salt Lake, they were almost destitute of clothing and nearly starved. The Mormon people gave them food and clothing, and employed them to work on the foundation of the temple until they had earned sufficient to enable them to leave the country. Of their subsequent history I have no knowledge. It is possible they returned to the scene of the disaster, as a little creek entering the river below is known as Ashley's Creek, and it is reported that he built a cabin and trapped on this river for one or two winters, but this may have been before the disaster. June 13. Rocks, rapids, and portages still. We camp tonight at the foot of the left fall on a little patch of flood plain covered with a dense growth of box elders, stopping early in order to spread the clothing and rations to dry. Everything is wet and spoiling. June 14. Howland and I climb the wall on the west side of the canyon to an altitude of 2,000 feet. Standing above and looking to the west, we discover a large park, five or six miles wide and twenty or thirty long. The cliff we have climbed forms a wall between the canyon and the park, for it is 800 feet down the western side to the valley. A creek comes winding down 1,200 feet above the river, and, entering the intervening wall by a canyon, plunges down more than 1,000 feet by a broken cascade into the river below. June 15. Today, while we make another portage, a peak standing on the east wall is climbed by two of the men and found to be 2,700 feet above the river. On the east side of the canyon, a vast amphitheater has been cut, with massive buttresses and deep, dark alcoves in which grow beautiful mosses and delicate ferns, while springs burst out from the farther recesses and wind in silver threads over the floors of sand rock. Here we have three falls in close succession. At first, the water is compressed into a very narrow channel against the right-hand cliff and falls 15 feet in 10 yards. At the second, we have a broad sheet of water tumbling down 20 feet over a group of rocks that thrust their dark heads through the foam. The third is a broken fall, or short, abrupt rapid, where the water makes a descent of more than 20 feet among huge fallen fragments of the cliff. We name the group Triplet Falls. We make a portage around the first, past the second, and the third we let down with lines. During the afternoon, Dunn and Howland have returned from their climb. We run down three-quarters of a mile on quiet waters and land at the head of another fall. On examination, we find that there is an abrupt plunge of a few feet, and then the river tumbles for half a mile with a descent of a hundred feet in a channel beset with great numbers of huge boulders. This stretch of the river is named Hell's Half Mile. The remaining portion of the day is occupied in making a trail among the rocks at the foot of the rapid. June 16. 
Our first work this morning is to carry our cargoes to the foot of the falls. Then we commence letting down the boats. We take two of them down in safety, but not without great difficulty, for where such a vast body of water rolling down an inclined plane is broken into eddies and cross-currents by rocks projecting from the cliffs and piles of boulders in the channel, it requires excessive labor and much care to prevent the boats from being dashed against the rocks or breaking away. Sometimes we are compelled to hold the boat against a rock above a chute until a second line attached to the stem is carried to some point below, and when all is ready, the first line is detached and the boat given to the current when she shoots down and the men below swing her into some eddy. At such a place we are letting down the last boat, and as she is set free, a wave turns her broadside down the stream with the stem to which the line is attached from shore and a little up. They haul on the line to bring the boat in, but the power of the current striking obliquely against her shoots her out into the middle of the river. The men have their hands burned with the friction of the passing line. The boat breaks away and speeds with great velocity down the stream. The maid of the canyon is lost, so it seems, but she drifts some distance and swings into an eddy in which she spins about until we arrive with the small boat and rescue her. Soon we are on our way again and stop at the mouth of a little brook on the right for a late dinner. This brook comes down from the distant mountains in a deep side canyon. We set out to explore it, but are soon cut off from farther progress up the gorge by a high rock over which the brook glides in a smooth sheet. The rock is not quite vertical, and the water does not plunge over it in a fall. Then we climb up to the left for an hour and are a thousand feet above the river and six hundred above the brook. Just before us the canyon divides, a little stream coming down on the right and another on the left, and we can look away up either of these canyons through an ascending vista to cliffs and crags and towers a mile back and two thousand feet overhead. To the right a dozen gleaming cascades are seen. Pines and firs stand on the rocks and aspens overhang the brooks. The rocks below are red and brown, set in deep shadows, but above they are buff and vermilion, and stand in the sunshine. The light above made more brilliant by the bright tinted rocks, and the shadows below, more gloomy by reason of the somber hues of the brown walls, increased the apparent depths of the canyons, and it seems a long way up to the world of sunshine and open sky, and a long way down to the bottom of the canyon glooms. Never before have I received such an impression of the vast heights of these canyon walls, not even at the cliff of the harp, where the very heavens seem to rest on their summits. We sit on some overhanging rocks and enjoy the scene for a time, listening to the music of the falling waters away up the canyon. We name this Rippling Brook. Late in the afternoon we make a short run to the mouth of another little creek, coming down from the left into an alcove filled with luxuriant vegetation. Here camp is made, with a group of cedars on one side and a dense mass of box elders and dead willows on the other. I go up to explore the alcove, while away a whirlwind comes and scatters the fire among the dead willows and cedar spray, and soon there is a conflagration. The men rush for the boats, leaving all they cannot readily seize at the moment, and even then they have their clothing burned and their hair singed, and Bradley has his ears scorched. The cook fills his arms with the mess kit, and jumping into a boat, stumbles and falls, and away go our cooking utensils into the river. Our plates are gone, our spoons are gone, our knives and forks are gone. Water catch em. Heap catch em. When on the boats, the men are compelled to cut loose, as the flames running out on the overhanging willows are scorching them. Loose on the stream, they must go down, for the water is too swift to make headway against it. Just below is a rapid filled with rocks. On the chute, no channel explored, no signal to guide them. Just at this juncture, I chance to see them, but have not yet discovered the fire, and the strange movements of the men fill me with astonishment. Down the rocks, I clamber and run to the bank. When I arrive, they have landed. Then we all go back to the late camp to see if anything left behind can be saved. Some of the clothing and bedding taken out of the boats is found, also a few tin cups, basins, and a camp kettle, and this is all the mess kit we now have, yet we do just as well as ever. June 17. We run down to the mouth of Yampa River. This has been a chapter of disasters and toils, notwithstanding which the canyon of Lodore was not devoid of scenic interest, even beyond the power of pen to tell. The roar of its waters was heard unceasingly from the hour we entered it until we landed here. No quiet in all that time. But its walls and cliffs, its peaks and crags, its amphitheaters and alcoves, tell a story of beauty and grandeur that I hear yet, and shall hear. 
The canyon of Lodore is twenty and three-quarters miles in length. It starts abruptly at what we have called the Gate of Lodore, with walls nearly two thousand feet high, and they are never lower than this until we reach Alcove Brook, about three miles above the foot. They are very irregular, standing in vertical or overhanging cliffs in places, terraces in others, or receding in steep slopes, and are broken by many side gulches and canyons. The highest point on the wall is at Dunn's Cliff, near Triplet Falls, where the rocks reach an altitude of 2,700 feet, but the peaks a little way back rise nearly 1,000 feet higher. Yellow pines, nut pines, firs, and cedars stand in extensive forests on the Uinta Mountains and clinging to the rocks and growing in the crevices come down the walls to the water's edge from the flaming gorge to Echo Park. The red sandstones are lichened over, delicate mosses grow in the moist places, and ferns festoon the walls. End of chapter 7 Recorded by Brian Ness